We'll turn our attention to someone I know you're very familiar with, world's runner-up, Jamie Park on the right, John Holroyd on the left. We've got Affinity versus Splinter Twin. Absolutely. Uh, John leading off with uh, a pretty nice Affinity start. He both won the die roll and has a Mox Opal for the, uh, the real quick opening. He can play Signal Pest as well. And now he's looking at the turn one Thought Cast. Oh no, turn one Signal yeah. Pest. And then he's got a backup thought. He's got a thought cast, obviously, to play on the next turn. So this is a very, very nice start. It's pretty aggressive. Let's allow him to attack for four. You know, yeah, four plus some infect damage if he wants to go that route. As Park hasn't even done anything yet. Yeah, I mean this is the type of draw that is a for sure turn four, mm -hmm. with chances of a turn three depending on what the the thought cast brings us. Jamie knows he's going to be under a lot of pressure. Game one is also the challenging game for a twin deck. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's got a lot of tools, and Jamie's deck is actually much better set up against Affinity than a lot of twin decks, but it's still going to be rough being on the draw behind such a fast opening. Do you feel like this matchup may be a little die roll dependent, especially for game one? Oh, I mean, every Affinity matchup often is, but um, I, I still like Jamie's chances uh, quite a bit because his, his build is very very well set up against Affinity. I know he plays with a lot of people and travel with people who all are playing Affinity. He's got a lot of experience against the, mat, uh, against the deck, but he's got things like Lightning Bolt, Electrolyze, and a sideboard full of ancient grudges, anger of the gods, all sorts of, of weapons to help him here. Really what he needs to do is just try to assemble his combo as fast as possible, and uh, hopefully by tapping something on the third turn, he can buy himself that one extra turn to get him to turn four where he can combo off. You see he's playing a Serum Vision, so he's already drawn the card, and he's figuring out how he's going to scry. You mentioned all those anti-affinity cards that he have, has in his deck. As a result of play a card like one Electrolyze, one Flame Slash, things of that nature, he's not on the full, you know, Four, four, uh, Deceiver Exarch, four Pestermites, four Twins, four Kiki Jikis. We don't really see that version anymore. He's got six of the Tappers, four Exarch and two Pestermites, and then four Twins and one Kiki Jiki. Yep. So he's got he's got more than uh, more than like for instance the Tarmo uh, the Tarmo Twin decks, but still not enough that you can count on it for sure. Whole run is drawn a very interesting card off of that thought cast. and it is a copy of Spell Sky. You see a New Age Springleaf drum here. Jamie Park taking a look, getting familiar with the new art here. But that uh. That spell sky that he drew is actually one of the more interesting things that he could find this game. It's just a one of in his deck, and it's great against Twin. Wow, that is absolutely backbreaking. That is, that is incredible. Not only does John have the turn four kill, most likely, he's uh, he's got a spell sky, meaning that Jamie is. I mean, Jamie is in a world of hurt. I mean, obviously, it'd be nice if he could just next turn flame slash the uh, the the. the, the a spell sky and then follow it up with a tap and then a twin but from the looks of it he doesn't have all those tools available to him right now he does not have an answer to the spell sky he drew a twin so he's got the combo if he can get rid of the spell sky but he's got so little time to even try to draw out of this. You saw an attack here for four, the two battle cries, of course, from the signal pest and the owner thought were going to come across. We don't even mention that a spell sky also adds to the clock. Oh absolutely. As well. Yeah I mean this is literally a two turn clock just showing his attackers will attack for eight, and then eight, which alone is enough, and that's not even counting if he, you know, sends in the nexus for a backup plan or if he draws anything. This is a ver this is a legit turn four kill on the play by Affinity with Spell Skite for interaction. Now this version of Affinity that John is playing, you know, you're wondering, does he have the reach of maybe of a Galvanic Blast? He does not. He's playing Thoughtcast two copies of that and then a couple copies of Master of Ethereum, uh, but no no red spells, you know, to go firing away with here, so no breach. And obviously, Jamie doesn't know that, so it's something he has to probably be a little bit scared of, but it's just something to keep in mind here as well. He doesn't have the reach that some other affinity decks do have, as Park's going to play a spell skite of his own. Now, the spell skite doesn't do a ton here, but it does soak up a little, a little bit of damage. If all goes well, the spell skite might buy him one extra turn, because he needs to find a uh, answer to spell skite ASAP. Holroy draws a card for his turn. You see, he's looking at his board here again. Those two signal pests, two ornithopters, a spell sky, which could be the backbreaker in this first game. Ink Moth Nexus, even though he looks to be on the damage plan, and he's going to send everything here sideways and resolve those two battle card triggers. Yeah. John's deck is built to be as turbo as possible. He's playing the four, full four Mox Opals, four Springleaf Drums, four ornithopters. He even has Welding Jar for additional zero-cost action, which will make him less vulnerable to Ancient Grudge than a lot of Affinity decks. You see Spell Scout's going to get in front of the attacking Spell Scout here, so we're going to get across here for two, four, five, six points of damage. Here's a Vault Scourge that'll just be hard cast from Holroyd. And much like Affinity often is, he's just all in. Every single card that he draws comes into play, and he's, hope he's hoping he's able to deal enough damage to get the job done. 
Yeah, Affinity usually plays uh, Magic a lot like Gabe Walls plays Hearthstone. Just all in, or poker for that matter. Just all <laughs> in all the time. Just It's just one way. Absolutely. Shout out to the number one Hearthstone player in the world, Gabe Walls. Indeed, indeed. Or soon to be. You see Parker's drawn a copy of Scalding Tarn. Now he's going to start doing some math here. If he plays a Scalding Tarn, how much can he take? He also has a Steam Vents in his hand. And Steam Vents, as great as a card as that is, the two damage that he deals right now, very, very relevant. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's only barely holding on, you know, with the, uh, the ability to live through this next turn. The tough thing is, what's the long-term plan? Like, how are you going to get out of this with that, uh, that spell skate? It looks like, does he have Cryptic Command? He does have a Cryptic. I'm not sure if that's going to be able to buy him enough time. That's the issue where it could play Fog, mode, tap everything, draw a card. Maybe he finds a Flame Slash that way. Yeah, because, I mean, Cryptic is potentially an answer to spell skate. It's just so hard to ever get yourself in a spot where you can afford to bounce the spell skate. Yeah. Aren't going to take a look at his options. They are rather slim at this point. As you know, honestly, Holroyd's start isn't even... I guess all that impressive. Not just a bunch of Ornithopters. It doesn't have the key cards like a Steel Overseer or Arcbound Ravager or Cranial Plating, but it's more than enough since he was able to just dump everything out there. Well, and the, the key, though, is drawing the one main deck spell skite. Yeah. I mean, talk about a for fortunate draw. Can't draw it if you don't play with it, though, and a lot of Affinity players don't. So Jamie realizes the straightforward plan, as much as he wishes it would work, is yeah. not going to. He just has to set himself up to have as good a chance as possible of drawing into some kind of removal that can sort of stabilize this game. As he does play Scalding Tarn, so you can put Jamie at a virtual eight life here right now. See the draw there from Holroyd doesn't look to be of much use. It is just a copy of Welding Jar. It's actually going to kind of one-up the, the Out of Flame Slash now. So now he has to get even more creative. It's going to have to rely on Cryptic Command, it looks like. Yeah, I think at this point, he's realistically going to have to just try dealing with all of the creatures, which is very ambitious to think that it might even be possible. But And he doesn't have any, you know, Pyroclasm or, you know, uh, Fire Spout or Anger of the Gods type effect in his main deck. No, he does not. So Park is going to sacrifice the Scalding Tarn. He is at that eight now. He's going to get a basic land. Can't afford to get a Steam Vents and take two more points of damage. We're going to see some sort of tap effect. It's either going to be a Pestermite or an Exar. The nice thing about the Pestermite is it can not only tap one of the Signal Pests, but block the other. Yep. Unfortunately, the Spell Sky can redirect it over. So the tap effect is mostly an illusion. And that's exactly what's going to happen. So Spell Sky is going to redirect that over. Park tried to tap down Vault Scourge. Ulrich said, no, thank you. Important to note that if you have a Deceiver Exarch, uh, uh, no, the Deceiver Exarch won't be able to, to block any of these creatures anyway, so. See, Pestermite's going to jump in front of a Vault Scourge. How do you feel the block on Vault Scourge as opposed to Signal Pest in this situation? So one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so one, two, three, he, four, five, no six. No, he could, he could take, he could go to, to one, right? Okay. He opts to block the biggest creature in, in Vault Scourges. That would be a 3-1 due to the two battle cry triggers. Oh, no, because of the fetch land, he yep. could... Yeah, he had to block this way. Which means, he, basically... I mean, this is all she wrote. He's got Cryptic Command to tap the team one last time, but he can't keep that up for very long. I mean, in theory, next turn he could Cryptic Command again, tap the team. Next turn, Snapcaster Mage, the Cryptic Command, tap the team. Yep. Just buying himself time at that point, though. Yeah, hopefully trying to get to a spot where he can eventually uh, do enough in one turn to break through the Welding Jar Spell Skite lock. Park, with a deep breath, passes the turn back over to Holroyd. Again, he does have Cryptic Command at the ready. We do know that. I think John's probably got an idea that that's what's ready as well. And here is the fantastic instant from Laurelin. So the modes will likely be tap everything and draw a card. And that's exactly what he's going to do. Now, do you get in there with the Nexus? You know, he hasn't shown a pattern of getting in there with the Nexus, which is a little bit surprising because he's had some spare mana over the course of the game. I, I still like the idea of getting in with the Nexus. You know, I, I think he's going to win the game via normal damage, but it can't hurt, you know, if you're allowed to get in some free points that way. Does he have anything more to commit to the board? Just a Vault Scourge. Ensuring even more so that Jamie is not realistically going to be able to stabilize this board. Jamie will take a draw. It's a copy of Lightning Bolt. 
unfortunately, another blank with that spell sky in play. It does mean that, uh, in theory, Jamie might be able to sculpt some sort of a scenario where John might, ex you know, might misplay if uh, if uh, he forgets to spell sky redirect, assuming Jamie has more cryptic commands. But I think without a cryptic, without the second cryptic command here. Uh, we're going to be moving to game two. And he's just going to pack it in. So John Holroyd is going to win game number one over Jamie Park. Affinity up a game here over Splinter Twin as these two players are playing for both an invite to the Pro Tour and top eight of the largest constructed Grand Prix of all time. We're going to take a look at the sideboards. You've got Jamie's in front of you. What do you like for your options? Jamie's got a lot of a lot of great options here. Really, really great options. I mean, the best anti-Affinity card there is, Ancient Grudge. It's not the highest impact, like some of the, the cards completely lock them out or destroy everything, but it's reliable. It comes down fast, early, and solves every problem very efficiently with more to spare. So uh, the two Ancient Grudges are going to be real big. The, uh, the two Anger of the Gods are going to be huge. Uh, in terms, of, I mean, just think about how much Anger of the Gods would have won that game at many, many different points. Yep. Uh, the Flame Slash, we're going to see Flame Slash come in in order to hit Spell Skite. Uh, I think we're going to see threads of disloyalty. Okay. Because he doesn't know how many Spell Skites John has, but he knows that he saw one game one, <laughs> sure and there's going to be more after Cyborg, most likely. So uh, threads of disloyalty is coming in. Engine Explosives is going to come in. It can serve as a, a poor man's sweeper, but it's another Spell Skite answer that also hits Plating and Steel Overseer. So lots and lots of great options coming in for uh, for Jamie. It's even possibly gets echoing truth, but I think I think he's not going to want to dilute his deck too much more. And he's got a lot of cards he wants to take out, like uh, dispel or or uh, or remand. But uh, he wants to keep his deck fast and capable of comboing. Sounds like he's going to give himself the ability to still be able to combo quickly, but really shift to like a really good control deck in the matchup. Well, yeah, the key is that he's going to be taking out most of his counter spells and replacing them with removal, yeah. with uh, sweepers of sorts, because uh, counter spells are not the way to fight affinity, with the exception of spell snare. Um, and cryptic command not functioning as a counter spell, but um, we're going to see uh, a switch to a sweeper strategy to buy himself the time to set up his combo. What are we looking at out of John and his affinity deck? John had one main deck spell skype. We saw that. He also has one in his sideboard, so you can expect that to come. In other cards here, he's got a Blood Moon, he's got a Spell Pierce, two copies of Dismember, Ray Revelation, two Torpor Orbs, two Thought Seize, and then a bunch of other bullets in Illness of the Ranks, an Ancient Grudge, and a Graph Digger's Gage, a Whip Player, and an Edge Champion. Dismember, fantastic. Breaks up the combo. Definitely. So you got you definitely want to have that joint. Same with Torpor Orb, gonna stop the combo as well. It makes it so that Jamie has to have a little bit of varied answers to be able to actually be able to go off. Illness in the ranks, the enchantment gives all non gives all token creatures, I believe, minus one, minus yep. one. So Pestermites will die when you try to go off, and Deceiver Exarch will have zero power. And then, obviously, we mentioned the Spell Skite. I don't think anything else is going to come in here. I mean, this is an absolutely incredible sideboard against Twin. Yeah. He was expecting to lose game one and uh, have to board in a lot of action. But having two dismembers, first of all, having, you know, four more Stone Cold Killers in the form of Spell Skite, Thought, uh, Torp Orb and, and uh, Illness in the ranks, backed up by awesome support cards like Dismember and Thought Seize. Um, I don't even, I mean, I, it, I'm not even sure where Ray of Revelation, Spell Pierce, and, uh, and, and, his own, uh, and his own ancient grudge potentially fall, but he has such an embarrassment of riches. I think the, the greatest risk is if he boards out too much of his action and becomes a control deck, too much so that he doesn't actually put enough pressure on Jamie, because even with all these hate cards, the long game favors Jamie. And that was the question I was actually going to ask you, is we talk about this embarrassment of riches that John has, six cards, potentially up to nine, if he wants to get really heavy on the sideboarding here. You know, what do you board out? Because you still want to be that lean, mean aggro machine, but you have the opportunity to really dilute your deck here and be too reactive, which is where Jamie wants him to be. See, I think he's going to board out uh, some of the random ground creatures. He's going to try to avoid getting blown out by sweepers. Okay. The Memnite could be blocked by Deceiver Exarc anyway. He's, uh, he's just going to board out a bunch of those creatures and make Jamie's sweeper plan actually much worse. I think that down a game, Jamie is a huge dog here because this is one of the most anti-twin cyborgs I have ever seen out of a out of a uh, affinity deck. And yeah, normally from affinity, you see a couple singletons that they can draw to potentially, and that's really it. I mean, often they'll have like a, uh, uh, you know an extra spell skite and some thought seizes, or maybe one removal spell. But here, having torpor orbs and illness in the ranks. Dismember and Thought Seize, Spell Skite. 
I mean, he's got so many possible angles of attack. This is going to be a true challenge to Jamie Park. And while he has a lot of great tools that'll uh, that that give him, you know, that make him, a, I think, a, a small favorite in any one game. I think being down a game with Affinity being promised at least to be able to go uh, first in game three, Jamie's going to have his work cut out for him if he wants to top eight this this Grand Prix. Well, Park is going to be on the play. He's on your right, as you mentioned. He is down a game. Both of these players, again, whoever wins this will be into the top eight of this Grand Prix and also going to the Pro Tour in Atlanta. Yeah, absolutely. Both of these players playing for that invite. Okay. And it looks like Jamie trying to keep it interesting for everybody at home by taking a <laughs> mulligan. Down a game, taking a mulligan against an opponent with nine hate cards. Jamie is definitely no stranger to, uh, to playing with style. If we do have any updates for you guys on other matches that are taking place, again, Michael Majors versus Weed Scott Vargas is our backup match. We also have we also have Todd Anderson versus Jarvis Hewn. Both those players will not be playing for top eight, but wh whoever wins that match will be qualified for the Pro Tour, so Todd might be able to get back on. Same thing can be said for Jarvis, as we have been informed that Michael Majors is up a game over Luis Scott Vargas. Majors, of course, playing Storm. Scott Vargas playing Malai Rapod. For those not familiar with Jamie Park's resume, he... Uh he was famous in two different generations. I mean, he was one of the old school players, uh, top eighting the world or top eighting a pro tour with mono red back in the jackal pup days. Okay. But then a decade later, top eighting a pro tour again, coming in second at the world championships as the first player to top eight a pro tour with cruel ultimatum. Who designed that deck? Was that you, maybe? Well, that was N that would uh, I believe that was actually Nasif's uh, Nasif's take on the cruel control. Okay. Uh, for that one. So but, uh, Park is going to start off with the Serum Visions here. Here, Serum Visions is mostly looking for Ancient Grudge and Anger of the Gods. I, I don't think Jamie realizes just how absurd amount of hate John has in store for him. So Jamie's going to be thinking, you know, I just got to make sure I, I can beat the early swarm. If he's got hate cards, what can you do? The thing that's strange about John's Torpor Orbs is that he knows everybody's going to have Ancient Grudge anyway. Yeah. Illness in the ranks, though, I absolutely love because it dodges most of the hate that people have for his artifacts. John's going to go on load and he plays a Glimmer Void into a Mox, into an Ornithopter, into a Welding Jar, into a Springleaf Drum. He's going to follow that up with an Arcbound Ravager. My goodness, is that a turn one? <laughs> You're telling me. And wow. he just says, all right, pass it back. You see Ravager will get its counter to start things off here, so... He's able to unload his hand yet again. But as you mentioned, that's part of the reason he's playing, you know, Welding Jar and all these zero-cars artifacts is because his version is very hyper-aggressive. He just very. wants to dump everything. Definitely. This is a, uh, this is a very, very all-in turbo hyper uh, championship edition affinity deck that is very much designed to uh, lay it all out and put somebody in a real short clock. And Parker understands as well that he's under the gun. And out of all the cards that John actually cast this turn, you could argue the one that's the most important is the Welding Jar. Being able to Welding Jar the uh, Arcbound Ravager, Jamie's so far behind because the, uh, the anything he can use to destroy the Arcbound Ravager is going to effectively trade with a zero-cost card. And then the Ravager is going to grow to be so big that he can't even deal with it in the future and for, with most of his cards. And if he actually does answer it, it makes something else a huge threat. Welding Jar... Uh, the best card in the format against Ancient Grudge. You've got a Lightning Bolt in the main phase here from Park, and that will take care of the Welding Jar. So Bolt trades with the zero mana artifact, and now Park is going to follow up with a Serum Visions. What do you think about Bolting here in the main phase instead of on John's upkeep or something in order to uh, tap the Ravager and prevent one damage? That's actually a really smart play that I hadn't considered there. You know, as you mentioned, it'll, take, it'll actually tap it and remove it so it can't actually do anything for the turn. You know, it's a little bit of a risk to allow him to have mana available, I suppose. That's true. So there's a bit of a trade-off there, and you know how much is that one damage actually worth as well? I think it's something that Jamie also would have to consider there. And by doing the bolt on his turn, I think he's basically saying the one damage doesn't really matter that much to me. This here's a copy of Signal Pest. Now this is a really, really, really good an uh, anger of the god situation for Jamie. The Arcbound Ravager will live, but at least John will be so all-in that Jamie can tap the only damage source with a Deceiver or Pestermite and uh, potentially Ancient Grudge to take over the game. Looks like Flame Slash was the draw here for Jamie. He has an exercise in his hand as well. The big question is, does he have the third land? Yeah, I mean, and he's got two different ways he could go with this. If he just Flame Slashes the Arcbound Ravager, he can force John to move all in on the, on the Ravager or just suck it up and be willing to not have the Ravager complicating things anymore. On the other hand, Jamie can also Electrolyze uh, 
for making sure that the signal pest isn't going to come down, which uh, it looks like Jamie is going to flame slash the Ravager. So four damage is going that way towards the beast artifact. And it looks like he is not going to risk it. He's instead just going to power up the signal pest. Now, to me, that feels like a win. Yeah, for Agreed? Jamie, I mean, the, things are at least moving in the right direction. Yeah. They're, they're still real bad, but at least he's, he is making forward progress because he's not going to die in the next two turns, and the, the card that was messing up most of his counterplay is off the table. Serum Vision is, of course, going to draw Parker card. He's going to scry two here. And again, we'll see if he does have a third land or not to play. But right now, he's got to contend for an attack next turn of it looks like at least three points of damage. The Ornithopters will be one power creatures. And the Signal Pest, signal pest itself, excuse me, has a one power creature right now. The thing that's so uh, compelling about Jamie's counterplay here is that if he can deal with the Signal Pest, John's offense is going to fall apart. Yeah. He's got a bunch of mana sources and a bunch of zero power creatures and a removal spell in hand. I, I think that... It's possible that, that John may have wanted to put the counter on an Ornithopter and uh, possibly even sack one of his mana sources just so that he's presenting a little bit more diverse of an attack. Blakeboth Nexus to draw here for John. He puts that immediately into play as we do find out that Luis Scott Vargas has tied it up against Michael Majors in our backup match. But John is going to attack here for three points of damage. He's going to put Park down to 15. And if you're Jamie going into turn four here, even though you missed your third land, you got to be feeling at least pretty good. Sitting at 15, that's a lot. I mean, it's definitely an improvement, but he's got a long, long, long way to go. Uh, he can engine explosives for zero, beating both Ornithopters and a Mox, which is at least something. It's more progress, but he still doesn't have a land, and there's a lot of things John could have to potentially mess things up for, for Jamie. Here we are really seeing what we, that, that experience we talked about with John drawing reactive cards yep. and not having enough pressure to actually put Jamie under the gun and punish him for being mana screwed. There's another Glimmer Void. Looks like John's going to fire up Blink Moth Nexus here in just a moment, and he will, and he's going to fire across here for three points of damage. Two from the Nexus, one from the Signal Pest. It's going to put Park down to 12, and for Jamie, you got to draw that third land, and it looks like he just did with a Scalding Tarn. Yeah, Electrolyze is going to be real big here. Uh, Electrolyze will draw him a card, help him make forward progress, and at the same time get rid of uh, get rid of John's single biggest threat, the Signal Pest. Now, if you're parked in this position, Patrick, you know that John's had a card in his hand for a very long time. Now we're thinking of maybe a reactive card, but there could be a bevy of reactive cards that he could have in his hand. So if you're parked, what are you? What are you scared of that card? Do you just think it's something nah. to break up twin? Yeah, I think that you, it's either a mana source or a uh, or a dismember. Okay. Cranial plating was the draw, so I promise you he was not holding that. And we'll see exactly how he wants to go about using this. It's likely going to go onto the signal pest and try to get in for a decent chunk of damage, but we know that Park has an electrolyze to break this up. Now, the uh, the thing Jamie's considering is, is he supposed to use his Pestermiter Deceiver Exarch mm -hmm. in order to uh, have a chance at, at, you know, scare John into thinking he's going to go off next turn? Yeah. I think you got to just take the conservative approach and uh, and electrolyze the signal pest while you well you know while you got the chance right now. Park going to search out a mountain with the scalding turn. He's going to go down to 11 to do so. You see the life total is 11 to 20. John is always going to be the aggressor in this matchup, and his life total doesn't really matter a ton. There is electrolyze. He's going to deal two straight to that. So bye bye signal pest. Park will add a land to his hand, and he has got to be happy with that exchange. Uh, Jamie is far from out of the woods, though. He's looking at a cranial plating, still another threat coming down. He can buy himself a few turns with Pestermites and Deceiver Exarchs, but he doesn't have a Splinter Twin yet. There is the island that he drew off Electrolyze. That'll come into play. He's got access to Triple Blue in case it's Cryptic Command time as well. And it looks like, uh, it looks like our computer says that Jamie has a 74% chance of winning <laughs> this game. I assume John is drawing to, uh, John is looking for some of his hate. Uh, ooh, Welding Jar, that's interesting. Doesn't put any more pressure on Jamie, but it does mean that his, his Nexus is protected. And uh, the, big th the big thing here is just that John is sitting on that dismember knowing that he's actually got a, a little bit of insurance. John elected not to attack. He could have fired up Nexus and then equipped it with Plating and tried to get in for a bunch of damage, but he just said, play Welding Jar and pass the turn back here. Interesting. I mean, he knows he's going to get Deceiver Pestermited, but... In some fashion. I ah, know. I like the Vendillion Click here. Vendillion Click is a nice creature to be able to block all these flyers, but at the same time, 
gives him a way to beat, break up a dismember without having to play a bunch of cards like Dispel. And Dismember actually takes down from Dealing Click. And I th again, I think of Jamie, that's a win. And it's all about the small wins leading oh, yeah. into the, obviously, the very big win. You see him wow. draw a Flame Slash for the turn. No, he drew Ancient Grudge. He drew Ancient Grudge. Okay, excuse me. Wow. That was, now, obviously, Ancient Grudge, not at its absolute best because of that Welding Jar. Jamie taking a quick little, <laughs> little peek there. But it looks like Jamie has Snapcaster Mage and Ancient Grudge. So even though he doesn't have green mana, he does have access to Snapcaster Mage to get another Grudge out of it if times get tough. Park just passes the turn back over to Holroyd. So John is going to take a draw. Let's see what he's able to find. Looks like a Vault Scourge rolled off the top there. Yeah, I think most likely Jamie's going to play some kind of a Pestermite, Kiki, uh, Pestermite Deceiver Exart type, untap his own mana, and Ancient Grudge the, uh, the Nexus if it was equipped with Plating. Since it's not, he once again doesn't have to actually blow it. Interesting. Park's going to go ahead and cast Snapcaster Mage right now. Let's see how he wants to use this. Jamie trying to establish control. He's basically using Snapcaster Mage and Lightning with the trade with Welding Chart here. Making his grudge even that much more backbreaking when it does get turned on completely with green mana. Yeah. And that will tap that, so much appreciate by the judge there. As there's a Misty Rainforest, so there's your green source. Wow. That was, that's excellent for Jamie. I mean, it, it has to come into play tapped unless he's willing to get shocked. But he's not actually under that much pressure because John is stuck in the classic affinity situation of only being able to present one big attacker each turn. So now Jamie feels as though he can finally start attacking. So he's going to come across for two here with Snapcaster Mage. It's very unlikely that, that this is going to end up mattering at all. But uh, Jamie knows there's no, no possible way that that Snapcaster Mage is blocking. Yeah. Not this turn, anyway. And Park is just going to pass the turn back. So John will untap. Again, he's cardless. He's playing off the top. That's a copy of Springleaf Drum. And this is one of the things that is a little bit frustrating with Affinity, I suppose, for lack of a better term of, you know, he has this insanely fast start, as we saw with the turn one Arcbound Ravager, but you've got a lot of bad draws in the middle and late game, like a Springleaf Drum, like additional Mox Opals. You know, high impact cards are obviously great, like Platings and Ravagers, but your low impact cards you know, in the mid to late game are very low impact. Yeah, I mean, Affinity is an extremely high variance deck when it comes to drawing off the top. You've got so many cards that are just home runs and so many strikeouts. Largely because you're so synergistic, you know? you know. When you have a card that lines up right with the rest of your cards, it's often game winning. But as we see here, Jamie's got an answer to everything. It's time to equip Vault Scourge. Now, if you're Jamie, do you just Ancient Grudge the plating, take the one, and save the grudge for a rainy day? That's what I would want to do personally. I think the only card that actually matters in play right now for John is Cranial Plating. Now, the alternative, he can just Pester Might or Deceiver Exarch the, uh, the Vault Scourge and save the decision for later. Yeah. Looks like he may have overtapped here. I guess we're trying to figure out exactly what's going to happen. Looks like we're in combat. So you see the judge is going to rewind some things. If we can find out exactly oh, I what think the he, is. I think he just hit uh, Undo, okay. like Alt. What is it? Alt it's U? It's Alt U on Magic yeah, I think yeah. he I think he hit Alt U. Not too familiar with the program? I know you don't play it a ton. Um, uh, I mean, I was, I was going to learn a lot this weekend, but... Uh, it crashed, so uh, I guess maybe next weekend. All right, we have a, a pester mic coming down. Looks like Jamie might be going on tapping his own stuff, so he's going to tap his own island. He's going to. He looks like he's happy with the trade here. Oh yeah, definitely. He's got the deceiver still in his hand. So now he's going to use the instant speed ability on cranial plating to suit up here. Now at this point. You use the grudge to prevent the uh, the damage. Yeah, Figure yeah. why not. Yeah, it's a little bit of a strange equip. He's gonna kill the plating. Now Pester might still gonna they're still gonna trade. Definitely. Yeah. I think John just wanted to gain some extra life because okay. he wasn't doing anything else with the mana. Okay. No, Computer so. has Jamie at a ninety-one percent. I would have thought it's a little higher, but 91% to win this game. So things get real nasty here now because Park can flashback Ancient Grudge on the Springleaf Drum during his turn, and then Hulroy doesn't control any artifacts, and so he'll lose the Glimmer Voids. That's huge. Now, I don't know if Park wants to take that route, and he's going to actually take a look at Glimmer oh, Voids. Oh, yeah. We're going to do this. We're going to do the exact same thing. We'll take a look at Glimmer Void because it checks at the end of each turn. Yep. If you don't have any artifacts in play, that's going to go bye-bye. Modern -bye. 
So Park is going to make that line in place. Let's get your spring leaf drum out of here. And John says, that's good enough for me. He's John out of here. packs it in. Yep. We move to game three. Jamie, a pretty incredible comeback. Facing down uh, the old turn one Ravager with Welding Jar. S misses his third land drop. Still climbs out of that one to even the score at one to one. So what do we think happened that game? John, Huff, John with a fantastic start. Jamie kind of fumbled and stumbled around a little bit. Was there maybe a little bit of mismanagement of Ravager? Should he maybe have gotten a little more aggressive with it? Was there anything John could do? Because he kind of, you know, didn't really draw anything in the mid game. Yeah, so I think, I mean, obviously, the way the game played out, it would have been real strong to go all in on the Ravager, but that's such a risky play. I don't know if that's realistic to actually do there. What I think he could have done is he could have sacked one, maybe two of his artifact mana, powered the Ravager up a little bit more, then moved the counters to the Ornithopter, meaning that Jamie has one more big threat to deal with, or just put more counters on the Signal Pest. Okay. Now, as it played out, Jamie had Engineer Explosives, which would have shut down the Ornithopter that's line. True. But uh, I think that John stumbling a little bit. I mean, first he drew his reactive dismember, which really didn't do a lot for him this game. But then second, uh, he drew a little too much mana and Jamie drew a timely Ancient Grudge. I mean, drawing Lightning Bolt to Ancient Grudges, we talked about how incredible Jamie's deck is set up against uh, Affinity. Both of these players have very strong builds against each other. Uh, John's build uh, much, much better against tw uh, Twin than most Affinity. Uh, I think Jamie, even though I think in any one game he has the edge, he was a dog coming into this game because of being down a game. However, we go to a game three where Affinity is on the play. Big advantage, but Jamie, a very, very seasoned veteran with a lot of experience in this matchup and a list tuned for it, I think that this is real close to 50-50. The play versus a slight edge in deck strength. You saw John there, and you see him right now on camera. A couple, a couple of deep breaths, maybe a little bit of nervousness here. Think about it. I've been playing all weekend long. You know 13-2. and two. That gets me to the Pro Tour. I got one game. If I don't win this match, I don't top eight, I don't top eight this tournament. I don't qualify for the Pro Tour. It's one game for it all. Same thing on Jamie's side. Emotion's probably running high right now. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's come to, but they've both come too far for it to end like this. Yeah. Not like this. Not like this. And it looks like John maybe knocked a card off the top of his deck. Not entirely sure exactly. So Judge is going to figure out exactly what's going on. But, you know, for yourself, if you're in this situation, does your body react a certain way? Do you think a certain thing? You know, do you try not to get too far ahead of yourself? I'm sure. But, you know, you just lost a game. You're like, ah, oh, I won game one. All I got to do is get one more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's definitely the type of situation where where my mind is, is saying no, but my body is saying yes. Sure. You know, to winning this match, moving on. And uh, you can tell John's a little shook up. I think he was already counting his, uh, counting his invite, his doing his victory lap. The uh, the start he had, that game one looked, so, uh, that game two looked so good, and yet Jamie managed to crawl out of it. I think if you're Jamie though, you're feeling pretty good. You're kind of on a free roll anyway. It looked like you were doomed when you missed your third land drop, mm -hmm. but uh, right now. He's living life and living large. These are my favorite parts of Magic, man, when it's all on the line. You got one game to play. There's a bunch of people in this round who are X and 2. There are going to be half of these. Half of these people are going to be very frustrated at the end. Half of these people are going to be absolutely ecstatic that they're qualifying for Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, and besides, you can't ask for it to be any other way. There's nothing more, you know, there's no more clean living than Arcbound Ravagers versus, uh, versus Splinter Twins. Yeah. That's just that's just good, honest magic, <laughs> the way that Garfield intended. We've got a nice start here from John yet again. A Dark Cell Citadel, a Mox Opal, a Signal Pest, and a Vault Scourge. So already he's going to start being able to get in, and his affinity count is very high. Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the advantages to playing with 13 Mox Opals in your yeah. deck. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> that's what Dark Cell Citadel, Spring Leaf Drum, that's what they kind of function as. All right, Jamie, once again looking at a ridiculous a ridiculously fast opening. The question is, does John have one of his heavy hitters? Does he have a Ravager or a Plating or a Master of Ethereum? Something that can, that can turn this reasonably fast start into a degenerate draw. Mox Opal looks like it's tapping for mana and it's going to replace itself in just a moment here. And yeah, we talked about that. 13 Mox Opals in John's deck. Yeah, he's, he's found that's two one of them. That's one of the prices you pay sometimes. So one, two, and three. It looks like Edged champion is going to show up and that's exactly what's here along with an ornithopter so he doesn't have one of the powerhouses but as champion actually does play a pretty important role in this matchup because metalcraft makes it so that it doesn't die to things like electrolyze anger of the gods ancient grudge any of that stuff yeah uh what's important about the edge champion is that he gives him a little bit of resiliency 
he, you know, you can't, you can't grudge it very easily. Uh, you can't an anger the gods very easily. This gives him a little bit of resiliency so that while he has Jamie on a three turn clock, even if Jamie fights back, it is possible that Jamie will get stuck, unable to stop the edge champion for the final few points of damage. Well, if you can see in Park's hand, he does have a copy of Splinter and Swin. It looks like it may be multiple copies. Not sure if he has a Pestermite or a Deceiver XR just yet. The big question here is, will turn four comboing be fast enough? Because he is obviously already underneath the gun and he just has to play Misty Rainforest and pass the turn back as Hellraid will draw a card for his turn. Yeah, I think the single biggest thing Jamie needs to do is deal with that signal pest, if at all possible. Well, Welding Jar is going to make that difficult now. Wow. If Jamie doesn't have a response here, and he doesn't, Jamie's going to be much further behind than he was hoping to be here. This is an attack for six. So this attack for six, assuming Jamie does nothing, is going to put him down to 12. As we are being told very quickly here, Luis Scott Vargas does win his match over Michael Majors. It will not put Luis into the top eight, but it gives him an X2 finish, more pro points, things of that nature. He's Make, got chances. I mean, he's in 14th place. I would be very surprised if he can jump all the way up to eighth. It's not impossible, simply improbable. Oh, I, I, yeah, I think that most likely Luis is looking at like an 11th place finish. Yeah. But he is very live. He's only, uh, he's... Yeah, he's actually only two percentage points out of... Uh, yeah, he's only two percentage points out, two and a third percentage points out. It, it's very unlikely, but it is very much in the realm of possibility. We've got a judge call here very quickly, so we'll figure out what's going on here in just a moment. For, but for Luis, you know, obviously a great tournament for him going X and two with Maliripot this weekend. Yeah, absolutely, and Luis making day two of a Grand Prix. That's what <laughs> no, it's, it is a real good tournament for him. Besting uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,293, uh, 94 uh, Other opponents. Other magicians, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Not so bad for the Hall of Famer. Michael Majors, don't want to sell him short. He had a great tournament with Storm. Definitely. He really did. And it's interesting, there, there aren't actually that many Storm decks up at the top. Yeah. Michael Majors, one of the best performers with Storm. Uh, an awful lot of people hating out the Storm ar archetype this weekend. And, I mean, we'll see what it looks like at the end, but so far it has appeared that Storm has not been able to weather the hate enough. I mean, it, had, it performed okay, but it's not dominating the way that it did two weeks ago. Now that people are playing the amount of rule of laws and graveyard hate they should be. So we'll see exactly what the question here is. The judge is back to the table. We'll see. Maybe a trigger was missed, maybe something with Battle Cry. We'll find out exactly what is occurring. We'll let you guys know at home in wow. just a moment. All right, we're bringing it back to us. So, Without knowing the ruling, it's looking like 75% for Affinity. 75 is, 75 is your, percent. That's your percentage. According, according to our little, uh, uh, little the, the, the overlay the isn't, uh, isn't on there yet, but 75% okay. for Affinity. See, Jamie's been against much longer odds before, but that's still a real tough spot to be in again against an Affinity deck. So for Jamie, he's obviously underneath the gun right now. You know, a card like Anger of the Gods can turn it around, I believe. He, maybe Ancient Grudge will also be able to get the job done. I think for John's side of things, he just needs to draw another action card because he, Edge Champion is, and Signal Best are playing the role of action cards right now with, uh, with Welding Jar kind of protecting him. But those aren't the heavy hitters from Affinity. Yeah, I, I, I think actually... I mean, it's possible that what he really wants is a, is a disruptive card because it might just be that Jamie doesn't have time to take over this game, and Jamie is going to have to just go for the Pestermite, Splinter Twin, it's over. Yeah. Or Deceiver Exert, Splinter Twin, it's over. And then all it takes is one reactive card, one dismember, one illness in the ranks, something like that. One Torpor Orb, one dismember, one illness in the ranks, one Thought Seize, one anything. Okay. Well, we are going to have a head judge coming to make a call now, so. Yeah, it looks like we're looking... It looks like one of the players, it looks like, looks like uh, the Affinity player, uh, John, forgot to gain life from his Vault Scourge, okay. which is his third violation for uh, missing triggers. Okay. And uh, that is potentially game loss yeah, material. We're walking, in a game, we're walking in a game loss territory here. So we will, uh, we will find out exactly what's going to happen there. I don't know if we have another backup match to go this to or not. This is the epitome of not like this. Uh, yeah. Not like this. I would say so. Not yes. like this. Yeah. Especially with all this riding on the line, would hate to see it go that way. Now, let's actually talk about that for a brief moment here, about, you know, triggers and how they build up over the course of the tournament. I know a lot of people 
you know, they don't like to call judges for something that seems so minor like that, but there is the ability to abuse something of that nature, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. And in this spot, I mean, it's not even Jamie who's saying anything mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, the missed triggers on John's part. And nobody's accusing John of having uh, of, of having uh, missed these for some, un, you know, deliberate advantage. But at the same time, there's a certain threshold in a premier level event that you have to play at. There's a, a, a point at which sloppy play is no longer tolerated, where you have to be able to, you have to do what your cards say, okay. you know, if you're going to be able to, if you're going to play at a professional level event. So, you know, have you ever, have you ever felt, you know, I, I guess a lot of players, when they're coming in a competitive match or something, they feel kind of bad about calling a judge in this situation. I'm not saying Jamie called a judge and say, hey, you missed his vault scourge again, but, you know, that's something that kind of happens where, you know, you missed uh, the damage on a fetch land. And then you guys kind of back and kind of correct a little bit later. And it's like, well, don't worry about it. I won't call a judge, something like that. But, you know, players kind of have this propensity, I feel like, of just a little bit of fear. I, I don't want to be a jerk to my opponent. But, I, you know, I, I don't think that they're really being a jerk about that. It's just trying to maintain a proper game state when you're playing a competitive tournament. I know that uh, the one of the last tournaments, you know, back before they changed the rules about missed triggers. Okay. There was a, I think it was the M12. Uh, there was a Grand Prix of M12. Maybe it was M11, but my opponent had a, or M10 even, my opponent had a creature that lets him gain a life every time uh, a creature comes into play. A soul word effect. Right, okay. and he missed 10 or 12 triggers. Okay. And this is before you, you couldn't let your opponent miss the triggers. Okay. So I had to keep pointing it out, but I didn't call a judge because I'm like, oh, I don't want, you know, I don't, oh, I don't. And it ended up costing me the match and, uh, uh, and, where like it ended up costing me a, a reasonably big finish at the Grand Prix because I didn't call on these triggers and uh, I don't know it, it depends if you're still if you're still hungry you gotta be you gotta hold people to a strict standard because people are gonna hold you to a strict standard yep. and honestly I mean you can't know that there this is gonna be the time where they miss ten times sure you know like I figured oh he missed I don't want to be I don't want to be a jerk it's not that big of a deal. But the 10th time, you know, in each time you think this is going to be the last time. Sure, sure. You know, so. you kind of reminded me, say, all right, you're at 19 now. All right, you're at 20 now. So. And if you recall, at the beginning of this game, John actually accidentally flipped up a card. Yep. I mean, he's just accumulating warnings left and right. It's been a long weekend. It's been really, I mean, you know, obviously very grueling. Huge amount of pressure. We saw he's a little frazzled yep. after that last game. And even a slow play warning for shuffling too long. Sure. So we're going to find out what the head judge wants to do about the situation. It would definitely be an unfortunate end to the tournament uh, for John, but the rules are the rules. I think for John, he needs to take one of these. He needs to take a, he needs to take a deep one. He doesn't have to do the hand motioning thing. If he, does, if he wants to, he can. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how much this helps going up and down and all around, but I think a deep breath might be in order. Wax might, might on. Be in, yep. Wax off. That. That. Might, it might be in order for right now. It is a very pressure moment for him right now. So I can understand, you know, I mean, it's it's very obvious. He's visibly nervous right now. I'm sure he wants it really, really bad. Yep. Well, it looks like it's been decided. Yeah. So Jamie Park wins one wins two games to one after John receives a game loss for yep. uh, excessive warnings. That is a very obviously difficult way to go out, especially when we're covering the match and we want to bring you the best that we can. You know, obviously we have a nervous player in there playing for potentially top eight of his first pro tour, top eight, of, or excuse me, top eight of his Grand Prix and an invite to his first pro tour. But there were obviously something that compounded, and it sounds like not just this match. Yeah, you know, and prior things that have happened over the course of maybe just today, over the course of the tournament. Yeah, over the course of today, uh, my understanding and. And honestly, I think this is going to give him a lot to learn from, a lot to grow from. It's going to be real, obviously, you know, hard. You'd be kind of sour or bitter right now, but uh, John's, a, John's a wise guy. He's, a, he's got a mature view, and he's going to see how he can get better from this, how he can improve and use.